Welcome to the One Fish Foundation Fish Tales Podcast. I'm Carla Stoll, president of One Fish Foundation, a sustainable seafood education nonprofit based in Maine. These podcasts feature powerful stories from fish harvesters, fishmongers, chefs, scientists, advocates, educators, and others around the seafood supply chain. Our first series of conversations comes from Bristol Bay, Alaska, where I interviewed a broad range of personalities with rich, disparate backgrounds. All of them share one common passion, their connection to the resource and staunch opposition to the proposed pebble mine at the headwaters of the world's largest wild salmon mine. This is of particular interest now as the US Army Corps of Engineers may release the environmental impact statement any day. The EIS is the critical report that would pave the way for the mine's owners, Northern Dynasty Minerals, to secure the federal permit they need to proceed. The mine would still need a bevy of state permits to actually begin operations, but the EIS is a really important hurdle for them to get past. Today's interview is with Melanie Brown, who lives in Juneau during the winter and fishes up in Bristol Bay during the summer. She's a fourth generation set net fish harvester working the site her great-grandfather established off the mouth of the Naknek River. When she isn't fishing with her two children, she's organizer for Salmon State, which advocates for preserving the habitat and abundant runs of wild Pacific salmon. I interviewed Melanie prior to the global pandemic outbreak, but her stories of learning how to fish, teaching her kids how to fish, and protecting the heritage and the priceless resource against the mine still resonate. We began with her describing a coming of age experience working the set nets with her great grandfather. I can remember one day when um, we had so many fish that we, we pulled our gear up onto the beach and our, the nets were just loaded with fish. And then my great grandfather and I were, we were left to, to clear um, uh, some gear while the rest of our crew went down the beach to go uh, clear the gear you know, that we, the sites that we had further down the beach. And um, so we, we set to doing it and I, it was my first chance that I really had at picking fish. I'd picked a few fish prior to that, but this was a big trial by fire. And my, my great grandfather and I, we worked side by side. And I just, I remember really feeling like our relationship took a leap forward and I could feel the pride that he had in me. Um, and that meant a lot to me. And um, I can remember noticing that, you know, as my little hands were getting stronger and more adept at picking fish, I recognized the fact that he in his older age was losing his strength. And there was kind of this passing of a torch, this crossing that happened between us and I can remember feeling kind of bad and having mixed feelings about him losing his vigor um, and declining in an activity that he had done his entire life and uh, I wasn't sure, quite sure how I should feel about that but then I remember there was something he said I wish I could remember what he said or there was just some something that he did that really conveyed this sense of pride and all those mixed feelings washed away and and i was able to enjoy that moment um, of just feeling like my great grandfather was ready to pass pass this to me or uh, recognize that it was passing on to me so so that that's something i'm always going to remember in my lifetime that seems like a very significant stepping stone in your evolution as, as a set net fish harvester. I think so, yes. It can, just out of curiosity, so can you describe a little bit, because some people may not understand what the set net looks like, particularly if you're doing it from shore. Can you? Yeah, I'll do my best. So um, I, I fish a gear type that's called gill, it's gill net gear. And um, it's when, when you set your gill nets, that means that your, your gear is anchored and fixed to the shoreline. Mm -hmm. um, you don't drift with the tide uh, like a drift fisherman would. 
where where you cast your net and then and then the tide and the wind carries you. If you're set netting, you have uh, an anchor on the inside of the shoreline, and then you have an anchor on the outside of the shoreline um, with a a line stretched in between. We call it a running line or our anchor line. And then when a when a opening is called by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, then we we set our gear on that line. We tie it to the line so it's fixed it perpendicular to the shore. Say here's here's the shoreline. Mm -hmm. Um and then our gear is straight out. perpendicular. So it goes yeah. straight out. Mm -hmm. Um we have a big barrel that helps to kind of float the outer end. Yep. And our gear is uh, 50 fathoms long. One fathom is six feet. So we're, uh, my permit through the state of Alaska entitles me to fish 50 fathoms or 300 feet of gill net gear. And on one side, so it's, it's 300 feet long and it's, it's about 12 feet deep. Um, and on one side of the, the gill net, the filament gear, um, <clears throat> It, it, uh, it's not monofilament, it's kind of a twisting of a, a number of fibers that are knotted into a pattern that resembles a chain link fence. And um, on one side, there's a cork line and that floats the gear. And that's the side that's tied to the anchor line that I was talking about. And then on the other side is the lead line that sinks the gear so that when the tide comes in and co covers the gear, the, the gear makes like a fence in the water. And um, when the current is running really strong, it kind of like, it causes the, the leads to rise a little bit, but it still sinks the gear enough so that if salmon are coming in with the tide, they'll swim into the gear, but they, it, and they'll, generally it, the gear is meant to be sized so that the salmon will swim past their gills, but yeah. not past their belly. They, you know, unless the gear is too big, then they'll squirt through. Right. Um, but otherwise, you know, they, they can't back out and they can't swim all the way through. And then when we're ready to, to clear our gear or check our gear, we get underneath the gear and we pull up the skiff. I fish out of a 22 foot skiff and the, um, we pull the skiff perpendicular through the gear um, and uh, over the gunnels. Uh, of the skiff. So, so we're basically pulling ourselves sideways through the gear. One person is pulling on the lead line. Um, on the other side, somebody or, or people are pulling on the cork line. And whenever a fish comes over the gunnel, we shake it out. And then we, we put them, we, we pop a gill so that they can bleed because it's much better for the fish quality. For the fish to bleed, there's less bruising likely to happen that way. And then we, we put the gear, excuse me, we place the salmon in our brailer bags, our no mar brailer bags, meaning they, they're designed not to mar the fish. Right, right, right. Yeah. Did so, I cover it? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's exactly as I remember it. I mean, all the aching muscles sort of announcing themselves again in memory. Uh, <laughs> so how long have you been doing that? <laughs> for a very long time. Um, I started in 1979 when I was 10 years old. And um, the only seasons I've missed were when um, I, I had my two kids. Right. I, I didn't time my pregnancies very well. So I had to yeah. <laughs> because my kids were born in summer months. And, um, and we fish from uh, our season lasts from the last week of June to the last week of July. Yeah. And so what ha what experience, what's it been like for you to teach your, your children who are now, how old are they now? My son is 12 and yeah. um, my daughter is 18. And it's, I don't know, all I can say is, I there's a lot of pride that I'm feeling, you know, it's, and I imagine that's probably what my great grandfather felt when he saw me starting to really catch on. Um, it's just one of those things where it's like, 
you, it's really hard to explain because it's just kind of this upwelling of feeling that, you know, like, wow, I, I just, I can't believe this is my child and they're carrying on, you know, this thing that our family has done for five generations now. Yeah, I mean, you're working on the fifth generation, so good job in, in mm -hmm. keeping that going. Um, and I just, I, I remember being in the boat and sort of that shared enthusiasm was really neat to experience all the way around the boat. Um, so that was, that was pretty special. For somebody who's never experienced what, what you were able to experience in Bristol Bay this summer, it, it, it must sound pretty exotic, <laughs> you know, and just really, really interesting. Um, to, to hear about something that's just not many people get to experience. Uh, but in Bristol Bay, it's not an unusual thing. There, there are many families all up and down the beach that uh, have been fishing for multiple generations. And to get back to your original question, is this an indigenous tradition? I guess you could, you could say that for sure, uh, because of the indigenous people of the area who have become part of the commercial fishing industry. Um, I think what we have, it's, it's really unique because it's a blending of commercial fishing um, along with traditions that existed even prior to the onset of the commercial fishing industry. Um, I, I firmly believe that my people and the other indigenous people of Bristol Bay they ended up there because they followed the salmon. I firmly believe that the salmon got there first and then the people followed them, found the salmon um, and knew that they would be provided for by these amazing creatures that sustained not only humans, but um, fertilize the land, nurture, um, mammals on the land even because of how they fertilize you know create create such fertile ground for um caribou and moose to browse on and um i feel like i'm digressing somewhat but it, it's just i think bristol bay for the the people of bristol bay who participate in the commercial fishery it's just this like i mentioned before it's this really interesting blending of mm -hmm um this of a, a way of life where where people are are able to harvest salmon to um to add to their bank accounts but also to fill their freezers uh for the winter a and um you know to to be able to smoke salmon if that's a, tra a tradition that their family participates in um, and, you know, to have healthy food available to them all winter long. I did want to ask, so when you're talking about indigenous um, uh, inputs and influence, and you're talking about your people, so what, you know, what tribes, you know, do, are, are your family coming from? Well, I should mention my father, he, he is in your fact, he comes from the north. Um, he's from a village called Unalakleet. And uh, there's definitely some Russian heritage mixed in there. Um, and uh, he met my mother at, at the university in Fairbanks. And the summer that they married, that's when he became a fisherman. He started out as a set netter and then he became a drift fisherman. And he actually already knew about um, Bristol Bay because of a boarding school that he went to, Mount Edgecombe Boarding School in Sitka. And he, he met somebody who had just completed a, a very successful season in Bristol Bay. And when he saw how much um, this man was depositing in the, the school bank and realized that he got it from fishing, my, my dad, he, he likes to tell this story of how he, he said, someday I'm gonna be a Bristol Bay fisherman. Yeah. And, and then he met my mom at the university and he found out that she was from Bristol Bay and he was like, oh, <laughs> you know, and he got his chance uh, because of my mom. Um, and he, he fished well over 50 years in the fishery. 
And, and I got to fish with him in the early and late seasons when I wasn't fishing my site that my great grandfather passed on to me. But um, my mother, she always identified as Aleut. And um, when I learned more about the language boundaries in Alaska, you know, where the lines are drawn, I, that always confused me. But then later on, I uh, came to realize that um, there was a lot of migration that happened during the Russian occupation because of trading. Um, and then there also, you know, when, when the commercial fishery was established in the late 1800s in Bristol Bay, that drew a lot of people because um, they knew they could get work. Um, and uh, so um, it made more sense to me, um, the fact that my great grandfather, er, grand, great grandparents identified as, as being Aleut or, um, Aleut is actually the imposed name. Um, it's the ethnonym, but the autonym of the um, Aleut people is Unangan. And so I, I now identify as Unangan, but also Yupik because there's no telling who, you know, who my great grandparents ancestors <laughs> mixed with yeah. once they did enter the Bristol Bay Basin. Um, so, and my great grandparents spoke Yupik. Uh, I grew up hearing them speaking Yupik and my mother understood them, but she didn't have a tongue for it because at the time that she was growing up, she was encouraged to speak English because her grandparents knew that she wouldn't be reprimanded for speaking a native language in an English school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I okay, so to, to answer your question, the indigenous cultures that I identify with here in Alaska are Inuit back to the north, they're an Inuit people, and Yupik, they are also an Inuit people, and Unangan, um, also known as Aleut. How long have you been fighting this battle? I myself, I've been involved in, in this fight um, officially as an employee, I guess you could say, working as an organizer since um, 2009. Um, so over a decade now. Prior to that, I was volunteering as much as I could because once I understood um, the damage that this mine could do to the region and to the fishery to, and to the last great wild salmon run in the world, I knew I, I just felt I had to be involved somehow. And so I just, I kept doing whatever I could as an individual, and then eventually it became my work. Mm -hmm. uh, so. What's at stake in your eyes? In my eyes, um, what's at stake is a way of life uh, for the people of the region and for the people who migrate there every year along with the salmon. Um, but also I feel like, as you mentioned before, salmon are a keystone species. And this is really the last, the last great place that wild salmon thrive. You know, it, as you know, there were once places all over the world, up and down the West Coast um, uh, of the United States and on the Eastern seaboard um, in Northern Europe. Uh, and all, all of the great runs of those places have been diminished by poor, um, poor development planning, by overfishing, by poor management. Um, and in Alaska, we've been fortunate enough to, um, that we've operated under the sustained yield um, principle of through the state of Alaska. Um, and it's it served us well in Bristol Bay, um, but we're seeing other places suffering. Uh, and um, it's hard to say exactly what, what's causing that, but Bristol Bay is, is still going really strong. And places to the north are um, proving to have increasing runs as well. But it seems like anything below the land uh, land uh, 
features of um, the Aleutians and uh, the southeastern panhandle, anything within those areas or south, um, they seem to be um, declining, unfortunately. And it's hard exactly to identify what's causing that. But I feel like with Bristol Bay, there's because it's still going strong, there's, there's still a lot to be learned for how other runs might be restored or repaired. Um, it's a perfect nursery for sockeye salmon because of the, my understanding is because of the relatively flat gradient that the tundra provides. Um, it, it, sockeye salmon don't, don't like steeper ground and so they, they do really well in, in Bristol Bay. I just think that if Bristol Bay goes away, if this, if this fisher, wild fishery, this perfect wild fishery is lost, I just feel like there's a whole set of dominoes that are going to fall afterwards. Uh, and I know, like, I'm not a scientist who can prove that with certainty, but it's just, I just don't know, to me, like, what, what else is left after this amazingly productive run of salmon uh, is gone. What else? What else do we have, really? What other treasures, biological treasures, do we have left on this earth? I imagine you, you, you've dedicated a lot of your life, particularly you know, these past few years, to addressing this, standing up to it. What does it cost you? Um, I, sometimes I feel like it's hard to keep it together psychologically, <laughs> you know, that I kind of oscillate between these moments of just feeling utterly daunted. Um, and then other times I feel so rich because, um, I know that there are other people who feel the same way and who love Bristol Bay as much as I do if not more. And when I get to um, come together and fight side by side, arm in arm with these people, it's, I feel like I'm getting, my spirit is receiving a gift that um, I don't, I think most people are never fortunate enough to experience in their lives. Um, it's, it's really, I, I feel really lucky that as hard as this fight has been and as scary as it is to think that this um, amazing place could be torn up, torn up and destroyed um, and that this fishery uh, will be diminished by that. Um, I just, I, I rest in knowing that I have friends that, and it, who have become family in this fight um, and it that makes me feel really lucky so I feel like for as as hard as it is in some ways I I feel like there's this there are these other things that help to balance that out but it also causes these extreme kind of feelings at times singing is my medicine it's and it's like one of the things that has really kind of helped me preserve my sanity i think in the midst of all the craziness in this world and the craziness associated with with this fight too and um yeah so definitely music has become a better a bigger part of my life instead of just kind of this side thing you know where i just gra grab my guitar once in a while i've i've had to bring music more closely to the center because it really does does help me and I'm, I'm always grateful when I have a chance to share music with other people as well. Our guest has been Melanie Brown, a set net salmon fish harvester out of Bristol Bay who is passing on the tradition she was raised in to her two children, the fifth generation. As organizer for Salmon State, she's a powerful voice for preserving these traditions and protecting the habitat for the fish that drive the Bristol Bay economy. Melanie's a dear friend, and I wanna thank her for everything she does in support of salmon, 
Bristol Bay, and everyone who depends on the resource. She's lent her voice to the Slow Fish Crew Together webinar series and a host of other projects to highlight the fight against the pebble mine. I want to thank all of you for tuning in to this One Fish Foundation Fish Tales podcast. Stay tuned for the next podcast featuring my discussion with Steve Curian, who, as of this broadcast, is out on his boat, the F.B. Ava Jane, out fishing for sockeye out of Neck Neck. Meantime, to close out the discussion, we're going to hear a clip from Melanie's performance during the last Slow Fish webinar about the story of salmon. It's a powerful song. Stay safe, everyone. We'll talk to you next time. I'm going to bring it down a little bit uh, uh, and sing a song that's more loving uh, in its approach. And uh, it was written by a woman named Ruth Unger. Um, and she was inspired to write it by the water protectors at Standing Rock. Um, Ruth Unger sings with a band called The Mammals, and you should check out their music. They, um, they learned from a great Mr. Pete Seeger. And, um, okay, I just need to calm down a little bit before I enter into the song. It's called My Baby Drinks Water. My baby drinks water, my baby drinks tea. My baby eats salmon from the Bristol Bay streams. My baby drinks milk Mother Nature gave me. So please spare the water for my little ones and me. Now money buys houses and clothing and more. And money buys food at the big grocery store. And money buys trinkets and money buys toys. But it won't buy the earth back for our little girls and boys. Do you measure your wealth? by the size of your purse. What size is your coffin? What size is your hearse? What size is your heart if you put money first? High over the children and their hunger and thirst. My baby drinks water my baby drinks tea. My baby eats salmon from the Bristol Bay streams. My baby drinks milk Mother Nature gave me. So please spare the water for my little ones and me.